Well, hey, everyone, this is Ron KC0QVT, your host of Ham Radio Heavyweights, a show where I interview influential people in the area of ham radios who wear ham radio has either directly or indirectly made their life greater. They've had more success. And I have a fantastic guest with me today. This I'm with Ward Silver, N0AX. Uh, Ward is a very successful engineer, electrical engineer, by the way, technical writer, author of many books on electronics as it relates to ham radio. And that includes the new release, or the fourth edition new release of Ham Radio for Dummies. He holds extra class amateur radio privileges and is a member of the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. One other point that I think worth mentioning is that he was a 2019 inductee into the Missouri University of Science and Technology's Academy of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Well, Ward, welcome to Ham Radio Heavyweights. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, Ron. Uh, in your book here, Ham Radio for Dummies, on page one, you state ham radio license is really a license to learn. So tell me how you got into ham radio. That line, by the way, is from uh, Dave Sumner, K1ZZ, the longtime uh, leader of the uh, ARL HQ and uh, CEO for a long time. Dave uh, knew a lot about what made camps tick. Um, yeah, uh, once you get in the door, you discover just how big ham radio is. And uh, the license ensures that you uh, know enough to get on and fool around. And uh, from there, you better, better learn it on your own. You've got uh, clubs and the internet to help you, but uh, you know, you've got to want to learn uh, yourself. That's how it works. Anyway, uh, how I got into it, I uh, discovered a QSD magazine in the Daniel Boone branch of the St. Louis County Library. One day, my mom would drop me off while uh, doing some other errand. I was less trouble in the library than I was on the errand. So I was wandering around the shelves, which were the internet of the day, I guess. And there on the, the shelf was the May 1966 QST. And I looked at it and I went, wow, uh, that was pretty much it. At that point, I decided I wanted to be one of those guys and um, started checking out all the ham radio books and the magazines and whatnot. It took a long time after that to get an actual license several years because I didn't know any hams. And finally, uh, my high school Elmer, at the time, WN0DYV, uh, now KJ7PC, Bill Agroski, took me under his wing, taught me the code, helped me over some of the rough spots and passed the novice. And, Late 71, got my license in February of 72. So how old were you when uh, mom dropped you off at the library and you first saw the QST? That's 11. You're 11 years old. So that's the when the seed was planted. Of 11. Oh, wow. And you got, you got licensed a few years later then? Yeah, I, I passed the license. Um, I was uh, 16 at the time. And um, yeah, that was, that's a good age for, uh, getting into technical hobbies and whatnot. I wasn't quite driving yet and um, uh, had always wanted to be kind of a mad scientist. So uh, this was sort of a natural. Very good. So you mentioned your mom, she dropped you off at the library. Were your parents or any other family members, did they have influence on you pursuing uh, area of technology? I mean, did an uncle or somebody show you? Well, um, my dad's a civil engineer, uh, okay. and uh, but he didn't really uh, think all that much of ham radio. Mom was interested in it only to the extent that um, I was interested in it, so she thought that would be a good thing for me to, to uh, fool around with. And uh, what really uh, sparked my interest, I think, in, in technology uh, was a family friend, I don't even remember who it was, gave me a couple of the old time life books, one on matter and one on mathematics. And I just was fascinated by all that stuff in there. I can't remember a time when I wasn't interested in science or technology to one degree. And that really launched me on a sort of omnivorous path to technical things. And eventually uh, uh, my roulette ball fell in the ham radio hole that day in the library. And that's pretty much been it ever since. So 
this this obviously culminated in you wanting to become an electrical engineer. So when when did you when did you know you wanted to become an electrical engineer? Oh, probably um, after I got into ham radio for a while. I, it was uh, I guess I was a uh, sophomore in high school at that point. At that up to that point, I had kind of wanted to become uh, a chemist, uh, something to do with chemistry or possibly uh, uh, physics. And uh, this sort of crystallized it. It was it was uh, not an abstract thing. It was actually stuff I could work with. I started taking TV sets apart, like so many other people did, and um, I found that hey, this is something a a person like me can actually do. There's a, you know, I don't have to go to school for 20 years. I can start working on this stuff right now. So I've got some heat kits and whatnot, and so I guess about a sophomore in high school, I said, hey, yeah, that's for me. Uh, we'll try electrical engineering and Missouri uh, S&T, better known as University of Missouri at Rolla. Before uh, that was right down the road. Um, my dad had contacts down there being a civil engineer. And uh, so I toured it and went down there with some of my buddies from high school and including Bill and some people that I'm still in touch with. and. That that was my that was my choice really, and then down there the nice thing about S and T was they give you a pretty broad education whether you like it or not, and um, so you don't really specialize until later. But when I finally did specialize, I started taking courses in communication and uh, circuits, that sort of thing. Little little things. The motors in the labs were kind of uh, intimidating, you know. Um, great big multi-amp 480 volt things that uh, rotated and, and did weird things that were a little uh, a little scary at times. So I decided to stay with circuits. Well, just just to let the viewers know, uh, I also went to Rala later than Ward, of course, but uh, I'm I'm intrigued because he was a graduate uh, in 1978, if I recall, and I graduated in '94, so I'm very he. Very familiar with it, of course, and and I also graduated from there when it was known as University of Missouri Rolla. I, now, you were you there before they changed the name from Missouri, from Missouri School of Mines to UMR? No, it was UMR when I when I started. I knew a few guys from the old days, but and they all complained about it. Oh, you yeah. know, Missouri School of Mines, whatever. But they still had the radio club W zero triple E, Absolutely. and. Uh, in the big old building on campus with the big tower and the wire that went from the power plant stack all the way across campus and all that stuff, uh, right next to the student union and had the last dime Coke machine on campus when I was there. So it so doesn't get any active? better than that. Absolutely. <laughs> were you active in W0 Triple E while you were there? Yeah, I, I joke that uh, I get a bachelor's in, in Triple E. I spent literally hundreds of hours every year either on the air or at the radio club. And um, it really uh, advanced my engineering career because it exposes you to so many different aspects. Ham radio goes for everything from power supplies and high voltage all the way through abstract math. And so you really uh, touch a lot of bases. So even though I technically could have been spending more time studying, um, ham radio for me was a big technical journey in it really uh, benefited me in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Well, I've been been down there recently, and they've got some neat gadgets. I actually got, you know, like I was telling you, I got a chance to get on top of the TJ Hall, which is the big dormitory in, in Rolla. It's the biggest, tallest building, and got to see where they put the repeaters, and pretty cool to see that. And and I also got acquainted with the new club. I wasn't active while I was in Rolla in the club. I, didn't, I wasn't even an amateur at that time. And uh, I'm now I'm now becoming a member of uh, W0 Triple E just by way of being an alumni. And it is a really cool thing. I, I kind of regret not getting involved because to your point, uh, you do get into you know all kinds of things. It helps set you up for a career. Yeah, it you know, does. Um, one of the things uh, that it really sets you up for, what I find is in, in ham radio, is that it, you lose your fear of knobs and adjustments and opening and closures and all these other things. You're a very hands-on person once you get into ham radio. And professionally, that's kind of rare. Um, students will come out of electrical engineering programs and unless 
plus they've had a lot of co-op experience or intern, um, they're, they're not as exposed to the system level idea as, um, as a ham radio operator is. So when I've done booths at the International Microwave Symposium, which is kind of the World Series of RF um, for the ARL, I've had many professional engineers and managers come over and say, boy, we need more hams. Uh, they hit the ground running. We, we still have to train them, but they know a lot of things about equipment and adjustments and wiring, and uh, they understand the system concept right off the bat, and they're much more valuable to us. So ham radio is good for you. Absolutely. So just to double back, you know, while you were at S&T, uh, you specialized in circuits, is that? Or, uh, yeah, circuits, and I was really interested in receiver design. The first batch of uh, uh, groundbreaking articles by Ulrich Rohde, now N1UL, and uh, co-founder of uh, Rohde and Schwartz, the big uh, German instrumentation yeah. firm, uh, were coming out in QST and Ham Radio Magazine and uh, really revolutionized receiver design for um, amateurs. And so I really took to that. I enjoyed it. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, circuit design and, you know, various things like that, right? working with mixers and amplifiers and stuff. So now you, you've got your degree and you start working as a professional. So I want to talk to you about your engineering career. And basically, where did you start your career and what did you do? Well, I'd spent a lot of years in broadcasting. I was also active in the uh, campus FM station, KMNR. And it's a, it's a wonder I managed to graduate uh, being so active in the two organizations. Um, so I did some broadcast work and then uh, wound up working for a uh, environmental services firm doing air quality sampling out of airplanes, small airplanes. And that was another, it was very ham radio like in that you had to worry about everything from the power connections all the way to antennas and portable repeaters and communications and uh, samples and chemistry was involved. So it was a very uh, multifaceted job and that lasted for a few years. Then I wound up moving out to Seattle, worked for a small marine electronics um, outfit for a while and then um, became an independent consultant and spent a long time doing that. I, more than half of my career, I've been an independent consulting uh, person, either troubleshooting or design in industrial electronics and then medical. And then uh, finally wound up my engineering career for physio control, which makes uh, cardiac defibrillators. Hope you never need one. And uh, Medtronic uh, for a while. So uh, span the uh, the gamut all the way from a uh, low level sort of a chief engineer uh, at small station kind of guy all the way up to systems and data comm. So learned a lot along the way. So what did you like most about being an engineer? Uh, the puzzle, the puzzle aspect to it. Um, as a troubleshooter, everything's uh, a puzzle. If it was easy, they'd have fixed it themselves before they call you. Uh, so you tend to get the really unusual problems that uh, people can't people can't solve on their own. Sometimes it's a, more of a political issue than it is an engineering issue, and you're trying to referee between groups. But um, I, I like the puzzle, the design aspect, and then um, bringing people together to understand it and uh, work on that problem together, build a, a product or a system or successfully complete a project. What I didn't like about engineering was the seemingly arbitrary decisions that would suddenly change all the constraints or requirements or kill a program for no particular reason that, that we could discern. Um, at some point, you know, if you've ever dealt with data communications, you dealt with the OSI seven layer model that talks about the physical layer down at the bottom all the way up to the application layer at the top. Well, I found out there were two more layers on top of that, uh, the, elect the uh, financial layer and the political layer. So uh, those often take precedence and you just have to deal with that. You're, yeah. you're uh, working with an organization of people and there are resource issues and constraints and uh, that's an important 
aspect of engineering that they don't really teach you very much, but you do have to exist in that world. So uh, the problem is it tends to be a, uh, dominated by concerns that don't really touch on engineering. So that can be very frustrating, but I learned how to deal with it. And, uh, and once you learn what people are interested in at that level, um, then you can talk to them and you can sell your ideas. So that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting aspect of engineering that you learn over the years that you can't take a course in it. It's something, it's a people skill, communication skill. And uh, I advise engineers to take some business classes so they learn how that world works. Uh, they're going to have to uh, live with it and in it. I agree a hundred percent. And uh, before we go into your writing career, I, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't, I want to know about a, an engineering project, if you could go back, that gave you the most satisfaction and fulfillment in your career. Um, well, you know, that first job with uh, uh, being the field engineer and wiring up airplanes and taking measurements was extraordinarily satisfying. It's a great way to exercise all my buttons. But um, I think as far as formal engineering, working for Physio Control and then Medtronic to basically uh, design devices that save people's lives was really uh, very, very satisfying. Um, that, uh, that gives you an Im immediate sense of, of you're doing something useful, you're doing something that's gonna have an impact on people's lives. And so you really, you really focus on it. Plus you meet some incredibly motivated, uh, knowledgeable people in that, that environment. So the, the medical stuff that was the conclusion of my engineering, formal engineering design career, that was, uh, that was the best. Well, I like it. I like hearing that. I, it, it definitely helps to uh, be around good, good people, b driven people. It, it, it lifts, you know, it lifts you up because uh, you, you know, it is tough at times, you know, like you said, going through the, uh, the uh, layers of, you likened it to the OSI model. I mean, I've never, I never thought about that. You know, the two layers above the seven layers. I always camp down in the lower three with the embedded firmware. So yeah, I get it. And because now I'm doing, I'm running a business now, and and I get it. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Physio had a uh, a motto, uh, you know, a mission statement that was very, very simple. You know, you dealt with these mission statements that um, are really kind of fuzzy. This one was, we build life-saving tools for life-saving teams. Pow! <laughs> that, that is a crunchy, pithy, gnarly mission statement. You know what you're there for. You know where the good arrow points, and that's what you work on. Um, and when you get a chance to work in an environment like that, um, that's, a, that's a good place to be. Excellent. Well, let's pivot to your writing career because that is where, you know, you came on a lot of people's radars. Uh, you know, I'm just going to I'm just going to quickly run down some of your works so that the viewers know you, you're the uh, chief editor of the ARL handbook, which I have right here. Uh, a lot of guys have this on their on their hopefully on their desk. Uh, I know, you know, that's the 20. Yes, it's a big it's a big book. Uh, Ham Radio for Dummies, which we've shown, fourth edition out now. Uh, grounding and bonding for the radio amateur, and ARL's handbook on radio experiments is volume one, two, and three. Uh, two way radios and scanners for dummies and circuit builders for dummies. And so that leads me to ask: Have you always been into writing since your younger days? I tell you, the fact that I make my living writing these days would amaze my high school English teachers. It would astound them because um, I was not really um, much of a writer at all. The, the guy who I credit with uh, really awakening me to the, the requirements to do it well and the power of it was my uh, sophomore high school world history teacher, Roland Klein. Um, and he didn't make a writer out of me, but he showed me the value of it. And so from there, um, I was just encouraged to write, and I guess you write a lot of reports, you write a lot of design documents, um, as a, particularly as a systems engineer or, a, or an architect, you have to sell your vision, not only to the people above you who are going to pay for it, but the people below you who have to implement it. And when I say above and below, I mean 
management, uh, really. Um, I considered all of them peers to one degree or another. But the idea is you have to explain and communicate your idea. And if you can't write or if you can't give a good presentation, you're going to have a hard time and be frustrated because you might have a really good idea. But if people don't understand what it is, they, they won't commit resources, including their own time to do it. So that's um, what influenced my interest in technical writing and, and prodded me to get better at it. Um, I guess I started with um, writing book reviews for a couple of the DX magazines, and then I wrote quizzes for um, Chad Harris's DX magazine for many years, and then uh, started writing some quizzes for QST and a few articles. And then finally, they said, why don't you take a whack at the uh, uh, technician license manual? They needed an author for that. And um, so that pretty much got me started. So about what, what year was this when you started pivoting into writing more? In, in um, leaving your right, after, um, right after uh, I left physio control, I was adjunct faculty at uh, Seattle University um, in the engineering uh, labs, the ECE department labs. Nobody liked to do labs, um, but I liked them uh, as an engineer. And so you had to write experiments for the students to do and, and you know, uh, learn about circuits and whatnot. And then you had to grade their reports and you had to uh, read what they had written and then explain things to them. And so that, um, that really got me started in, in being coming and in, interested in explaining technical things. And so, a lot of the early ham radio, uh, hands-on radio columns are from the Seattle University experiments. And oh, wow. uh, if you go back and read the early ones, you'll see they read a lot like an engineering lab experiment. Well, they are, and um, that led to other things. So you were the author of these, these early articles then because of your uh, background in writing technical reports, things of that nature, and then you just morphed into this writer for uh, in the ham radio world that they then began to use DX Magazine, you say, quizzes. So those were your well, first I got, projects. I got on people's radar um, and then started contributing various pieces and uh, wrote a couple of articles. And um, I guess they, they thought I could be put to use um, in the license manuals and QST columns. And and so um, I had a pretty good run in hands-on radio, 15 years of that. And um, I've done all the license manuals now since 2003. Uh, the first one came out in 2004 for the uh, ham radio license manual. And then I've done all the license manuals since. Well, I, I wanna just tell the viewers that, you know, it is tough to write technical literature at times and to also make it simple uh, and for people to understand. So uh, that's why when I was reading your works and all the things that you've done, and it's very impressive uh, that you're able to communicate very complex ideas at times and make them simple and easy to read because uh, that is a challenge. And I know, you know, we live in a day of email and, and it's very difficult to make sure your thoughts are very coherent and that you're uh, explaining yourself because people oftentimes read into things that you don't know and you've got to explain, you know, you know, what you're trying to say in a, and make sure you're not misunderstood. When you're writing for a ham radio audience, you have people who are Nobel Prize laureates all the way to people who have never picked up a soldering iron. So you have a pretty broad audience and you have to work really hard sometimes on the complex concepts to get them right. I remember spending maybe three or four days on the two pages of the extra class license manual about electromagnetic waves. Uh, it's, it's a very deep subject and it's easy to get off into the weeds of the various technicalities, uh, but then nobody would understand it. So how do you explain what an electromagnetic wave is? Uh, it's a hard, hard thing to work on. Um, I, I learned the value of a quote from Twain about, I regret that I wrote you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. Uh, I understand that real well now. <laughs> 
Well, let's let's get into one of these works that you just recently uh, had. It's come back out. The uh, it's the Ham Radio for Dummies. It's the fourth edition, which means it's been out for a while. But now we've revised it. So, what inspired you to to write the book now in its fourth edition? Well, the fourth edition is brand new. It just came out in April. Um, the first edition. Uh, let's see. That was about two thousand and. Eight, I think 2008 or 9 that I started working on that. Um, the Dummies series had kind of appeared at that point and they were still an independent company with a lot of windows titles and things like that. And so um, I was talking to Mark Wilson, K1RO, who was the QST publisher at the time. And I said, you know, we really need a ham radio for dummies. There was a lot of technical books, technical for dummies topics coming out. I said, is anybody writing one of those? And he said, I don't know. And uh, we kind of agreed to not not know whether anybody was doing it. And then two weeks later, I got a call from uh, headquarters. The publicity person said, I just got off the phone with an acquisition editor at Wiley and they are looking for somebody to write ham radio for dummies. Um, would you uh, would you be interested? I said, well, sure. You know, and the so I had a, a good conversation with them and was contracted to write the first edition. And so they've asked me to do updates now three times in a row. And that's pretty rare for a, uh, a four dummy title. They tend not to have a, a multi-edition lifetime, but this has been out there, sold many thousands of copies. Um, I'm not getting rich. I don't have the Jaguar dealer on speed dial. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice sideline. And it's been a, a very good um, project to work on. I really feel like people are getting a lot out of it, getting a lot out of it. Uh, I can tell I can attest to that. And just just to give you an example, uh, yesterday, or no, it was Wednesday when the, the book came to me. I simply, I, I had a guy take a photograph of me holding the book. And I told every, and I'd already gone through it. And I told everybody I, in a Facebook post, I said, hey, this book is gold, you, you know, check this out. I'm an extra class operator and I found it extremely valuable. Well, interestingly, this post has gone nuts on our group page. I mean, people are, have bought the book as a result. They, they can identify with, you know, I said, don't let the, don't let the title fool you. There's a lot here. And just to, just to go through it a little bit. I mean, the book covers, you know, it all from getting licensed to getting on the air and maturing as a ham radio operator, which includes contesting. And, you know, for me personally, I found it an extremely valuable resource because oftentimes, you know, we just don't know where to turn, you know. Uh, so I'm curious, what has the feedback been like from those who've read the book? Well, that's been pretty much it. Um, you know, everybody's a dummy about something. Yep. Um, and um, so ham radio for dummies was I wrote it from the perspective of you get your license and now what? Now what do you do? Um, you know, if you've got somebody to take you under their wing, that's that's solid gold. That's the best. But a lot of people are self-taught now and um, they don't uh, have that same one-on-one -on -one relationship with an experienced ham as many of us did back in the day. So I wrote it. I said, what would, what would a technician need to know? What would a... Uh, general class license uh, person need to know when the doors to HF open up and you're a technician, you ordered a radio or maybe you e haven't even ordered a radio yet and you get this thing and now what do I do with it? You know, how am I supposed to operate this thing? And sometimes the manuals are helpful. There are other websites and YouTubes out there that are really good. A lot of video, uh, Facebook pages, things like that. But it's nice just to have a reference that you can put on the desk and st put sticky notes in it and write in it and all this kind of stuff. Just uh, it's a desktop Elmer, and that's pretty much it. I think the um, the one thing that I tried to avoid was making it into a study guide. There are some really good study guides out there. I wrote one, <laughs> uh, but there's also the W5YIs. Um, uh, K1PI has his system. There's, you know, all kinds of different uh, ways to learn this material and it's out there. So I said, go find that, go use that. This book will kind of tell you about what the license process is, um, but it's not going to be a study guide. So there's been some give and take about that. 
think people would like a one-stop shop, but that would make the book about that thick and um, uh, it would be hard to keep it updated. So uh, I said, make a conscious decision that we're gonna um, stay out of the study guide business. I do flag stuff in the new edition that's likely to be on your exam. So you get an idea of what to think about. You're talking about the fourth edition here? Yes. Yeah. So what, where, you what see, where you see the tip icon, they have these little icons over the side. If something's going to be on the exam, I'll say, hey, the exam is probably going to ask you questions about this. So what what is new in the fourth edition that you've learned from the previous editions? Are you just keeping up with technology or is there some new information that folks need to know? Well, there are a lot of things that are in flux with ham radio. I think the biggest is the shift to digital modes and uh, uh, digital systems. And uh, radios that are digital are operated differently than analog radios. So the first three editions, the super heterodyne receiver and, and the associated transmitters and things, those were still dominant technology. But since even in the last few years, the SDR and digital systems have pretty much displaced the super heterodyne after its run of nearly a hundred years. Um, we are now in the, in the land of SDR. And so the, the tuning process, the signal selection process, the, the way you detect whether a signal is present, all these things, all these operating things are changing. So it's important to, educate people about what the super heterodyne world is like, because there's still a lot of analog uh, radios and modes out there. But I needed to rewrite that book um, to the sections that describe how to operate. I needed to explain that in terms of digital systems too. So there's a lot of rework, a lot of new things in there. And, um, a lot of new uh, types of operations. For example, the parks on the air, summits on the air, a lot of these portable mobile things that, that have sprung up. These are very, very popular. So how do you do a mobile station? How do you do a portable station? And so you know, I've updated all the technology and reworked completely the how do I operate sections. It looks like you're almost using this book as an excuse for you to learn a whole lot of new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they say, if you want to learn something, teach it. Um, I re remember talking to a guy, uh, Whiskey Six Chicken Feathers, Jim Maxwell, um, <laughs> who's a famous ham, died, oh, 10 years ago, way too soon. Jim was a, uh, a triple doctorate, I believe, physics and math and all sorts of things. And uh, he was a technical fellow for the Lockheed Corporation. And he became the Pacific Section Director. Um, and I was talking to Jim and he said, the thing that really amazes me is here I am. I have all these degrees. I have 40, 50 years in the hobby. I've done all this. I've done all that. And he says, what amazes me is when I go to club meetings and go visit hams and stuff, how many things in ham radio I didn't know about? How many people are doing an innovative, experimental, uh, public service, all this stuff. And so I had to he said I had to back up and, and take a position of, of humility that I need to learn from these uh, all the different hands, not so much they need to learn from me. So, yeah, doing a M Radio for Dummies, a big, broad scope book like that, I just learned a tremendous amount. Well, folks, it's available. Uh, I'll put the link down below uh, to get this book. It, it is a nice resource, so I definitely want to recommend that. So of all the books that you've written or edited, uh, which one did you enjoy or learn the most while writing? If you had to go back and dig through this volume of stuff you've done. Hard, hard to say there, uh, Ron. That's, that's a, a good question. Um, I think one of the ones that's most satisfying to me to be the editor of or of which to be the editor um, is the handbook um, because I learned so much from the handbook as a kid and even as a young professional that uh, to be given the, uh, the steering wheel to that book and say, here, um, go edit it. Um, it's like, uh, uh, it's a dream come true really. 
and then to get the antenna book a little later. But I would, I said, well, I would, I will edit this, but I'm going to completely take it apart and put it back together. It's, it's needed a, a big update for a long, long time. And you're going to have to let me break it and put it back together. And they said, okay, have at it. And uh, so the 2010 edition came out. Um, uh, it was way different than the 2009 edition. And I got a lot of positive feedback on that. So that was very, very satisfying to me to take a book that I had just treasured and revered as a young person and get to update that package of material and curate it. I certainly don't know everything that's in it. I rely on a big stable of volunteer um, authors and reviewers who uh, contribute a great deal, but I'm very pleased to be associated with that book. Well, I wholeheartedly agree. In fact, the, the first time I opened up a handbook, I I was impressed because, you know, I'd just gone through engineering school and I couldn't believe it. But because I, I had this impression that ham radio was not as advanced as an engineering degree, of course. And I go into this book and I was surprised. I mean, everything was there. It was almost like an engineering uh, a, a compilation of all the engineering textbooks that I had seen. So, yeah, if you guys get a chance, pick up a copy of that book as well. It's definitely a gold mine of information, especially if you want to revisit, you know, your engineering days or even get acquainted with a lot of these ideas because it is a wealth of information and big time props to you for being able to put all that together. Yeah, and it's a bargain. Um, you get oh, yeah. stuff in the handbook along with this enormous package of downloadable information that uh, if you went out and bought a professional equivalent book, it would be several hundred dollars. And uh, so you've gotten the benefit of some really skilled, very talented, very knowledgeable people putting their, their heart and soul into this information for ham radio. So it's, I continually wrestle with uh, people who want me to make it more advanced. And I, I said, well, you know, what I can do is, uh, I can take them to where they can see what you're talking about, but the book has to be accessible for the motivated uh, general class and technician class amateur. That lowest rung of the ladder, they have to be able to reach it and start climbing. So um, that's what the handbook's job is to uh, educate uh, and illuminate and help you along the way to the point where if you wanna go for it, if you wanna become a real serious expert, this will help you launch. Um, and a lot of us have started that way by reading the handbook um, and learning from it. Well, it certainly is a hidden treasure. I think, uh, as you've stated, it's, it's got a lot, it's a good value for sure. So with, with, your, with your writing career that you're doing now, how often are you writing and putting out content these days? Oh, only when I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been doing this uh, essentially full time for, oh, probably uh, 13, 14 years, something like that. Um, I just finished this run of doing three books. The, uh, the next handbook, or just wrapping that up, the Ham Radio for Dummies and uh, fourth edition. And we've been working on an update to grounding and bonding. So um, it's, it's a pretty continuous process. I wear out keyboards and tables and uh, pretty much uh, burn the midnight oil a lot. So I do a lot of it. Well, you, you've answered a couple of the next questions because I'm, I'm wondering what's keeping you busy the most. And it sounds like there's a lot of stuff on your plate. You've got, you know, it sounds like you got three books in the, in the works. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. uh, three books time. And I think the biggest uh, year we ever did was a uh, new extra class license manual an antenna book and a handbook all in the same uh, period of probably about six or seven months and we pulled it off but uh, that was that was a little too much what's coming up is um, the hundredth edition of the handbook which should be a, a great thing that's in 2023 and at some point there will be a new edition of the antenna book so Lots of good stuff coming out there. Well, one of the things that uh, I've watching your career and all the writing you're doing, it, it echoes what I've been told because I've been moving into a little bit more writing and creating. And, and one guy said, if you can get into copywriting, you'll never starve. I mean, it's it's impressive how a person's career, if whatever they're doing or whatever they're an expert in, if they can just begin to write about it, begin to teach it, 
there's so many people that are interested in information products, books, you know, courses on the internet. And of course, you know, you're falling into that and doing an awesome job. I mean, you're just, your works are almost everywhere. You know, if you look, especially in ham radio, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very impressive. So, so let's move into your, your, your ham radio interest, because, you know, one of the things that, you know, after reading your QRZ bio, you know, you're pretty active as well, just you know, not, in, not only writing, but you're, you're on the air. And one of the things that seems to be a passion for you is contesting. So, you know, wh- what, did you, what did you have to do to get into the CQ Contest Hall of Fame? Oh, that's, that's an interesting story. I was contesting before I even got my license. Um, the, ham, the high school club guys, uh, WA0, WBJ, and Bill, who I mentioned before, and Don Reeder, and Gary Novak, and, and those guys, um, we would all go over to Bill's house. He had a 35-foot tower with a two-element quad and a Drake transceiver. Woohoo! You know, and it was, it was a good station, and so we uh, did sweepstakes and some ARL stuff, and then uh, that was right at the time I was studying for my novice. So I, I had some contesting under my belt before I even got licensed. It was all supervised. It was all completely legitimate. But, um, uh, you know, it's always been part of the uh, of what I do. What I like about contesting um, is the ability to make lots and lots of contacts all over the place fairly quickly. I'm really interested kind of in the technical aspect of it. Um, it's nice when you place high and uh, and do well, but what really gets me out there is the my signal um, can be heard all over the place, and I I can literally hear the world turning when I'm doing contesting because as the world turns and the sunlight uh, illuminates different parts of the globe, you can hear bands opening and closing, and you work these little gray line things, and then you you find a little skew path uh, down over the Mediterranean. I'll let you bounce some 15 meter signals up into Eastern Europe as the band is closing. It's, it's a, an amazing thing. And when you sit there for hours and hours and hours, um, all, this, all this actually transpires in, right in front of you. You can see the gray line on a map and you can listen to the effect on the signals. Um, I remember being down at HCAN uh, 2001 for the CQ Worldwide CW contest on 80 meters and listening. This is before the contest. We just put up a two element wire Yagi at 140 feet on top of a hill. We could hear everything. And uh, right at sunrise in the Ural Mountains, you could hear the dawn enhancement as these little 25 and 100 watt guys would call in. You could hear their signal building. Sometimes it would build and fade within the space of a minute. And uh, we just chased that all the way across the continent until sunlight illuminated the last Irishman, and that was the end. And um, it was a, literally a chance to hear the world turning. So that's why I like contesting. Um, but the, the Hall of Fame is, uh, was a tremendous honor. I had no idea. Um, it's not because I have all these world records and stuff. I don't. Um, it was they tell you it's not just because you're a hot operator, but because you give back. And that was really the, the, the thing that set me back and made me feel the best about getting in is that I've made some kind of contribution to the sport and to ham radio. So there you go. Okay. Okay. So it wasn't like you were just, you know, burning up the airwaves all the time. It's just because of your, uh, well, that probably had something to do with it, but you're just an educator and a, an influencer in the space. Yeah, I guess um, uh, it was uh, it was an interesting thing to hear about, and it was a great honor and to be up there with some of those other names. Some of those guys are just world class operators. Uh, they set the standard, uh, you know, records that stand for years and years and years. I'm just proud to be up there with them. Some of my best friends are in there, and it's just. Um, it's just mind blowing for a kid that I look back at my first sweepstakes log not too long ago. And I just went, Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, I struggling to make each QSO. And I remember that, that pretty well. So being in the hall of fame is just astounding. 
So if any of you guys are interested in getting into contesting, the Ham Radio Dummies has a big section on that where Ward actually walks you through what it what what it takes to get a rig going and some of the things that you can do. So he kind of helps get you get your feet wet, which I think is extremely valuable because a lot of times you don't even know where to start. Right. So it all a, sounds so great... intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I've seen it done, but I've just I've, I've not participated in it myself. I've been camping in the digital space for so long, you know, and, and of course, that's a big, big sandbox as well. Now, another thing that you're doing that I notice is you're competing in these is in these de-expeditions. So uh, can you tell tell us a little bit about what that is, as well as, you know, where have you traveled? What's the best place you've traveled on a de-expedition? Because that sounds pretty cool. Well, I'll, I'll throw this out there before I launch into that. Field Day is coming up, and Field Day is a great way to get your feet wet with semi-competitive uh, operating. Go find mm-hmm. the, the contest operator tent and uh, sit down, put a pair of headphones on and listen, and they'll put you in front of the microphone after a while. But the expeditions are, are like uh, extended contests, and um, you go some unusual and interesting place. You don't have to go on... Um, you know, a worldwide uh, adventure, and they say it's not a real adventure if you enjoy it while you're having it. <laughs> uh, you don't have to go someplace like a desert island to be in a de- de- expedition. Grid squares can be a wonderful DX location, um, like on six meters or, or VHF or rare counties. Um, summits on the air, parks on the air, all these programs um, have a, a very good scale for the beginning operator to go out and be DX for a day. Uh, find your state QSO party and, and go camp on a county line or drive around in your car and operate. It's uh, tremendous fun. But I've been fortunate to go on one major de expedition, and that was to Curie Island, which is out of the very far northwestern end of the Hawaiian island chain. And it's out past Midway. It's another 60 miles past Midway. It's a long sail, let me tell you. And it's, it was five days out, and it was nine days back, right into the wind and uh, on a 70-foot boat. And luckily, I'm not too seasick. Um, but it was, it was quite an adventure. We were out there. You really feel like you're out there doing something. And you put up the antennas and... Everybody from all around the world wants to talk to you and you go as fast as you can. In the meantime, you're, you're hot and you're tired and you're sunburned and, you know, bugs are biting you and crabs are nibbling at your toes and there's spiders the size of a dinner plate and uh, all these kind of things. Been down in the Galapagos. I've been to uh, Puerto Rico. Um, I've operated a few places, but nothing like uh, some of the, the real de-expeditioners. If you want to go on a de-expedition, um, I suggest that you, you do some contesting so you get a feel for what it's like to be on the right side of a pilot. And, um, and then uh, maybe go yourself a couple of times. Just go to uh, one of the U.S. islands, uh, Hawaii or Puerto Rico or something, and uh, take a small radio with you, get a, a flavor for it, and then, um, and then be active. And at some point, maybe a de-expedition will call you. Or if you see a team advertising on one of the email reflectors, hey, we need another operator for our trip to Grenada, um, call them up, ask them. Sometimes they'll ask you, sometimes you ask them. But don't be shy and uh, be willing to work and work hard, work before the expedition and during the expedition and be a good shipmate. That's what you gotta do. Yeah, some really good advice. Definitely. Uh, if you've got a chance to do something like that, you, you've definitely helped me uh, see what I need to do. I think the field day might be where I need to start. So yeah, as field I was, day is like a mini de-exposition. Really yeah. Is. No, it's, it's coming up. Definitely. Well, you know, as I was looking through your uh, QRZ profile, you mentioned something about, I'm, I'm going to see if I can pronounce this correctly, but the Yasme Foundation, that looked really cool when I went to that website. I guess you're the president of this organization. And it, it, can I you am tell the that, president. Yeah. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what this is? Because it, 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 it looks like it fits right in with your de-expedition, you know, interest. Yes. Yasme is a very famous name in de-exing. Uh, it was the name of the boat of a fellow by the name of Danny Weil, Victor Papa II, Victor Bravo, who was the first 
serial the expeditioner along with Jim Denniston, W0DX, and a few other people. And um, the foundation was founded in the 1950s to help with his operating expenses. He was a solo guy, a young fellow from uh, England, and um, he decided, like many British uh, young men, to go to sea. And so he bought a boat and refitted it, and off he went. And somebody said, hey, you really ought to take some ham radio equipment so you can talk to people. So that's how he got into it, um, and then became famous for activating Caribbean islands back in the day when uh, they didn't have jet airports that you could just fly into. Uh, some of these were hard to get to, in and out in the Pacific as well. So then Danny retired, uh, having sunk three Yasme boats <laughs> uh, to various mishaps. Um, and he, uh, he re decided that while he still had his, his skin intact, uh, he, he quit DXing. And so the foundation was idle for a little while. And then two benefactors of the Yasme Foundation, well, Lloyd and Iris Colvin, who are very famous uh, now, decided that they would pick up the the gauntlet and Iris is in her famous uh, words, why don't we go? And so they wound up visiting well over 200 countries and operating from 169 of them, I think, over a period of about 30 something years. Um, Lloyd actually died uh, while on the final expedition. And so from there, Yasme became this foundation where we support various little projects that promote amateur radio around the world. Our latest big project has been to purchase and equip um, several reverse beacon network hosts with nodes, meaning receivers, automated receivers, to go into places that um, are very underserved with, with these receivers. And they provide both amateur radio information and scientific information. So we have this, this hybrid of science and amateur radio project. And plus we support scholarships. We, we recognize people that are doing cool stuff with our excellence awards. Uh, go to our website, it's just yasme, Y-A-S-M-E dot org, and you'll find all about it. Um, there is a brand new free downloadable PDF version of the Yasme book by Jim Kane, K1TN. And it explains so much about the early days of post-war DXing. You'll hear all these names like Don Miller and the Colvins and Gus Browning and stuff. Who were these guys? Hmm. Well, um, the book plays it all out for you. The price is right. It's a fascinating read. And Yasme is uh, from the Japanese word Yasube, which means appeasement or content. And so uh, Danny named his boat be a refuge of peeps, and uh, that's where the foundation gets its name. Well, I'm going to put a link in the show notes below this video so that folks can check that out. But yeah, there is a free free book for you guys if you want to check it out. It's 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 pretty good. Uh, very very good uh, historical perspective on DXing as well as uh, this gentleman that got this thing started. You know, I want to pivot real quick to um, another passion of yours, and I know that we didn't talk about this in the in the setup here, but you know, you look like you're really big into MCOM as well. I noticed that you have a passion for that. You know, and making sure folks you know, uh, set up a, you know, bug out bags, almost prepper my, you know, um, I shouldn't say a prepper mindset, but, you know, just getting, make sure, making sure folks are prepared for a disaster. And, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to this because I had a, myself, I had a, an interesting, uh, success for my, in that a repeater that I put on the Island of Dominica when Hurricane Maria hit. And I was told later that this repeater, kept the island communicating for three days and it was the only thing that they had it was a ham radio repeater or somebody that bought one from us set up and that was just a major success so you know you've spent a lot of time in your book here ham radio for dummies talking about mcom yes mcom and public service um, are the biggest reasons that people get interested in ham radio nowadays personal uh, emergency communications uh, then they generally spread out and start thinking about their communities, like maybe a church or a city. Um, and then uh, there's opportunities for public service all the time, various events and parades and fun runs and whatnot. 
uh, those are excellent practice for uh, when you might have a real emergency or disaster. But the idea is that you have to get on the air, you have to practice these protocols, you have to um, exercise your equipment and your own personal abilities, and uh, that makes you an effective communicator. It's not something that, like a flashlight, you can buy a radio and throw it in a drawer and then suddenly when the tornado roars over you, grab your uh, radio and suddenly you're saving the day. It doesn't work like that at all. Um, you need to practice, you need to become part of a team or a group and know who they are. They need to know who you are. You need to know uh, something about how to interact with them. Every group will have different types of protocols. The incident, incident command system, the ICS is the standard, but there are a lot of different um, types of groups that get together. For example, Saturn, S-A-T-E-R-N, um, is run by the Salvation Army. And while this is a faith-based group, you're not required to be a member of any particular religion, but they are a wonderful uh, group in terms of organization. And they get out there and they have their mobile kitchens and they show up. You can work with the Red Cross, you can work with your fire department. I used to live on an island in Puget Sound. And believe me, um, a mild earthquake and a giant ice storm really got people's attention. And uh, we had uh, been a, a good ham club before that, but um, then we got real serious about it with the community. And now the community knows about the hams and we are uh, allied with CERT and various other things. At any rate, um, emergency communications is one of the five fundamental pillars of amateur radio and the basis and purpose. And I encourage everybody, no matter what their interests are, to have some capability um, for mobile or portable, or just be able to use your station in support of disaster relief or emergency communications. It uh, will serve you well and you'll feel good about uh, all the good things that hams do. Well, uh, just to tell viewers that uh, if you want to get into MCOM, Ward does a great job in showing you what to do, where to start, how to get involved in local organizations, some websites. It's in this book that he's just releasing again, fourth edition. Well, let's wrap this up. I, I am having a, a really, it's really a pleasure to visit with you about your career and the success that you've had. I am just blown away. I mean, I, I, I we just barely scratching the surface, guys. And I like to ask this question to folks that, you know, I th you know, that I just wonder what makes them tick. But I would what is your superpower if you had one? I mean, in other words, what is the one thing that you can do really easy? I can I can mangle song lyrics and turn them into ham radio songs real fast. <laughs> now, now, what does that what? mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for spurious emissions. Uh, you'll find this little band that I put together with K4RO and KX9X and W4PA and even the current QST editor does a couple of really fantastic songs. Um, and we just take song lyrics. I'm the Weird Al Yankovic of ham radio. How's that? And, oh, wow. uh, and we just make them funny. And sometimes they're, uh, they're a little too truthful to be comfy. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. We just thrash around. We practice uh, basically once a year. So we're not very good. Don't, don't anticipate professionalism here, but everybody laughs in the right place. So that's, that's pretty good. But seriously, uh, uh, the thing that I'm most proud of being able to do is explain stuff to people. Uh, that's my thing. Take a complex technical concept and boil it down and present it in a way um, using analogies or drawings or what have you so that um, a person trying to understand it will understand it very good very good so so what's next for you in the in the area of ham radio well you know as i wrap down my uh, writing projects what i would really like to do is uh, uh, do eme um, i've got a bunch of digital voice equipment that i need to uh, integrate we're in the process of adding an aprs gateway here at my station um, I've just got a huge list of things that I want to do. So my, my next interest will be doing a lot more of ham radio than writing about it. Okay. Okay. You, 
If you could summarize the values and ethics that have guided you to being a successful engineer, a writer, a ham radio operator, and just an all-around good citizen, what would they be? What, what shaped you? Uh, well, I think um, the first thing that you have to realize is coming out of you, you know, your schooling and your early career is that the laws of physics have no coefficient for your personal ego. The, the coefficient for your personal ego is zero. And the, the harder you try to jawbone your way through problems, the worse it will get for you. And so at some point you have to realize that um, you need to stay to the truth, technical things. They will, they will humble you every single time if you forget that. So that's really important becoming a good engineer is that you have to understand where you, what you can control and what you cannot. And the, the other thing uh, that really sticks with me is from a professional um, seminar that I went to and a lady by the name of Amba Gale uh, was uh, helping us understand each other better and all this kind of stuff. And she said, uh, listen for the other person's greatness. You know, uh, even difficult people that you're trying to uh, interact with or be challenged by, they all have some kind of value that they profess or they exhibit or they can contribute. And if you can suppress your own ego for a little while and really listen to them as a person and as a, uh, a human being with interests and challenges and background, then, then you can find that greatness that they have to share and work with them on it. And I've dealt with a lot of difficult people throughout my career, particularly as a consultant where you drop into an emotionally charged situation and you listen to the greatness, uh, you'll find it. Everybody, everybody has it. It's out there. Go get it. Well, folks, if you guys want to get acquainted with uh, Ward's work, this is a great starter. He has got a lot of works. He's in uh, QST magazine oftentimes. He's written uh, several articles uh, for other uh, publications, DX Magazine. He's also the uh, editor, uh, chief editor of the ARL Handbook. And, uh, yeah, go get a copy of this book. Uh, where can people follow you, Ward, if they want to? Where's the well, best, where's the I best a, place? you know, on Facebook, um, you can follow me if you want. Um, basically, I'm too busy to really have much of a website or anything like that. So um, keep track of the books. Uh, you'll see my postings on email reflectors and in articles and things. And then after, after I get done with the books and, uh, you know, I kind of hand off that part of my career, um, Ellen, my XYL, KD0, PES, um, I, I was talking to her the other day. She says, I said, what do, what do you think I ought to do next? You know, write more funny song lyrics. And she says, no, what you ought to do is do some short videos about amateur radio. So I'm thinking at some point I might start up a YouTube channel um, so mm -hmm. people can see the strange things that I'm interested in and, and what I'm doing. So keep an eye out for that. Right now I'm doing books. Well, good, good. Well, folks, uh, Ward Silver, N0AX, he is truly a ham radio heavyweight. I have enjoyed this visit with him. Uh, it's great to know him more. Uh, I'm, I look forward to meet, you know, seeing him more at Ham Fest because he's, he's definitely a player in ham radio. Anyway, have a great afternoon, folks, if, and uh, thank you for tuning in. 7-3.